Hello, today is October 13th, 2010. We're meeting today with Mr. Joseph Scanlon at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Joe, or as you like to go by, Gene. Uh, thank you no. for participating in that. No, Joe's fine. Okay. I go by Joe mostly here, too. So. Okay, well, uh, maybe it, uh, kind of a funny story, uh, if, as we were talking earlier, if you could explain. Uh, yeah, my dad's name was Joe, and uh, his was Joseph Yale, and mine was Joseph Eugene. And so uh, when I went to service, they started calling me Joe all the time, and I missed a few assignments because I always went by Gene. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's... Uh, that's how we got started in the service. Okay. Now, okay. if you want to... Yeah, let's start out if we could, though. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, and a little bit about your family. Okay. Uh, we uh, were born in uh, 1922, November, and uh, we uh, uh, went along like that for quite a few years till I graduated from, from high school. Now, where were you born? Oh, Des Moines, Iowa. Okay. Yeah, everything happens in Des Moines until I went to service. So you grew up and, and went through the school system and such oh, in yes, Des Moines? right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how about uh, any uh, brothers or sisters? No. I had a brother, but he was uh, killed in a motorcycle accident in 36. He was delivering groceries with a sidecar on the motorcycle, and he got tied up in the streetcar tracks and it threw him off. Oh, I'll be darned. Oh, so, boy. So, anyway, he was a senior at uh, Simpson College. He had a contract with National Geographic to travel the world and take pictures and everything, and this was in 36. And that would have been quite, a, oh, absolutely. quite an opportunity. Oh, I'll be darned. But, uh, so he didn't do that. Now, what did your father do for a living? He was a traveling salesman. And uh, he uh, traveled uh, a 60-mile radius all around Des Moines. And uh, uh, before that, he was uh, ran a grocery store. In fact, uh, he had a grocery store in 1922, which they called the Pop and Mom Grocery Store. And this uh, grocery store uh, had a, a Model T pickup truck that he delivered his groceries in. and. Uh, uh, this is, uh, and then of course he didn't live very good. Uh, he died in in uh, in '43, and uh, uh, he just made his territory of two weeks, and he talked uh, my mother into driving for him, which I was a little concerned about. But anyway, she drove, and they were on their way back into Des Moines. And he just laid back in the seat, and that was it. He uh -huh. made his territory, and kind of a story of all of its own. I'll be darned. Yeah. Well, let me ask you before we get into your, your military experience yeah. about another major historical event during that time. Do you remember much, and was your family affected much by the Great Depression? Well, yes. In fact, Dad lost his grocery store that, okay. in '29, and he had a stack of receivables it was probably that high and in 1960 my mother got an, uh, a note from a lawyer that uh, he had uh, six hundred dollars for and uh, come to find out that somebody must have had a conscience and paid up I'll be for done. the store going broke uh -huh. and uh, uh, yeah my mother died in, in, at 65 and, and so uh, uh, my bride here, uh, she uh, had a, she was a twin, and her twin died at, uh, at two years old, so it's just been Bonnie and, and uh, Joe <laughs> <laughs> ever since uh, 43. We've been married 67 years. Wow, wow. And, uh, uh we had two girls, and uh, they're all uh, married. Now we have 
three grand great grandkids. So that tells you our age, I guess. Yeah, right, right. And our length of marriage. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, Jane, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your military experience now. Okay. Uh, so you graduated from Des Moines. Uh, yeah. high, East, I, East High School. The, what the, what year did you graduate? In uh, 40, 40. Oh, I'm sorry. Forty. Nineteen forty. Okay, so that was uh, before the war. What did you do between uh, high school and before you entered the service? Well, I uh, went to work the first day I graduated for a company. Staffing company, and they were making all sorts of ordnance equipment, and I got into the engineering department, and uh, uh, the three engineers who were there went to California to work in the aircraft industry, and so I hear the low me was in this engineering department, uh, running it, and uh, I was very lucky, I guess, because. Uh, uh, the company was making. So you were in the engineering department then, and your, your company made uh, the fins that went, you put on the ends of bombs, is that That's correct? That's right, bomb fins. And uh, we made uh, cartridge storage cases, which was to pack powder in for uh, 105 and 155 millimeter howitzers, and uh, uh, bazooka fins, and uh, uh, extensions and so forth for motor bodies for bazookas and uh, all sorts of things of that nature and uh, so I'd had enough of that I was going to go serve in, in a war someplace. Well now uh, where were you and do you remember where you what you were thinking when when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes i tell you about that. My uh, girlfriend which is now my wife, and I had gone out to uh, a small town in Iowa, and uh, uh, Dad had premiums that he would, portable radios, which was about this size, and they, uh, uh, we took and put the radio up over the back seat because it was close to a window, and uh, we turned it on, and we listened to Pearl Harbor. Oh, boy. And we, and uh, we looked at each other and said, "Well, I guess our life is spelled out for us." <laughs> I'll be darned. But anyway, uh, and I was of course working in, and uh, um, we were making all this ordnance stuff, and uh, uh, Dad got real sick. And the opportunity came for me to have a deferment, right. so I took it, and he passed away during my deferment. And so I said, "Well, guys, you got to handle it on your own." I'm now uh, the deferment was it because you were in the, uh, uh, in the military, in military industry, or because your dad was sick? No, but, but because I was I was uh, connected with all sorts of ordnance okay. equipment. Yes. Okay. And uh, so. Uh, and, and I took the six months deferment because I knew Dad was not feeling well, yeah. and he did pass away during that time, and so then I turned around and uh, uh, signed up, and I signed up for the engineers, thinking that would fit with what I've been doing and everything. The, the Army engineers? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they fitted me with a shovel, and I figured that isn't what they told me they were going to do. But anyway, uh, I stayed in there, and we we uh, built uh, daily bridges and uh, things of that nature, and we laid down an air field. And all this was in Illinois, and uh, was and it, this, said, was this part of your uh, boot camp, or did, was this yeah. addition? Okay. And I said, now wait a minute, this isn't for me. So they posted on the bulletin board that they needed pilots and navigators. That's for me. So I went ahead so with I that. to the uh, Air Cadets in Wichita, Kansas, uh, the Municipal University of uh, Wichita. So we were there about six months in, in college work and training mm -hmm. and so forth. 
and we got all ready to go to Santa Ana, California to learn how to fly, and they announced to us that we're sorry, we do not need any more pilots or navigators, and so we're going to send you to the infantry. Now, oh, at that point, that was probably the greatest letdown in my life. Oh, sure. But uh, 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 I ended up in uh, the 97th Infantry Division in the Regimental Headquarters Company, INR platoon, and our job was to uh, recon, come back, and make uh, situation maps for the regiment, things of that nature. So, uh, being in recon, would that involve going behind enemy lines at all, or were oh, you? Oh yes, we had uh, we had a jeep. There was three jeeps in our regiment that was assigned to that, and we had a 50 caliber mounted in the center of this jeep, and uh, we went out and. Recon found where the enemy was and sometimes had to return fire because it was not our position to return fire. And uh, we'd come back and lay this out and so on. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we did that uh, the whole time I was in service. Well, I want to back up. I, I definitely want to get into this more, but I want to back up your story. Uh, so after they discontinued the cadet program. Uh, you went from California. Where'd you go to California? Where did you join up with the 97th at? Uh, in uh, uh, in Missouri. Okay. At, uh, I'm not sure. Don't remember the name of the cadet. That, that's now. fine. Jefferson uh, yeah. Barracks, maybe. Jefferson Barracks. Okay. Yes. So now, uh, were you given a choice there, or were you just saying? Uh, were you just told? You're going. You're going to the no, infantry ninety-seven. Uh, because we joined the, the, the ninety-seven. You see, we, that was already established. Oh, okay. So they looked at my background, seeing I'd had engineering and and uh, drafting and all that kind of stuff. So we were able to uh, get in regimental headquarters, thirty sixth okay. infantry division. Okay. So seventh division. Excuse me. So then uh, you, you've. You've uh, linked up with the 90s, uh, joined up with the 97th. I imagine you worked your way to the East Coast to, to embark for Europe or take your story? Well, to San Luis Obispo in California and trained for the invasion of Japan. Oh, geez. So, anyway, we did that and uh, I went to uh, uh, Camp uh, McCoy, no, not Camp McCoy. Well, anyway, I went to a school to learn how to interpret photos of aircraft uh, photos in 3D. And uh, so then I went back there and, and uh, then we uh, had the bulge in Europe. Then we said, well, we're sorry you're going to Europe. <laughs> so here we had all of our training and everything. Going. We went to Europe to back up the uh, the um, bulge. Okay. And so then we. So from California, where did you, you I imagine, went cross country to, to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey? New Jersey. So uh, you guys arrived in New Jersey and this and that were you, you to, boarded ship? Yes. Can, and we landed in La Havre. Well, let me ask you uh, here's, a, here's a boy from the Midwest, Iowa. Landlock, Iowa. What was? Uh, can you talk about that chip crossing at all? What was that like for you? Did you get your sea legs? How did? Uh... Well, here's the bow of the ship, and here's the water line, and my bunk was right here. <laughs> so that was noisy, and I always thought to myself, well, now if we hit something, I'll go out to the hole. Well, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but anyway. Did you have any problems, any worries no, with uh, no, German subs at all? No, or? no, we went across good shape, and uh, we landed in La Havre, and uh, we went from from there all over the country, and. Um, well, now, how was it for you guys? Because here you were preparing for to head to the Pacific, 
you guys arrive in Europe, which was right in the middle of probably the coldest winters they'd experienced. Yeah. Did you have the proper clothing and stuff? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they outfitted us again. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, we, uh, uh, we were all over the country. I have a map here that I kept. Yeah, we'll, we'll dig that out when uh, at the end of the interview and we'll, we'll okay. videotape that, you bet. Right. But uh, we went from the Har around the corner there and we picked up all of our equipment and we went across to Dusseldorf, across the Rhine from the Dusseldorf. And that's where we went into combat. And uh, uh, the Germans were firing rockets at us and everything else. And we tried to cross the blown up bridge into Dusseldorf, and there was so much machine gun fire on the other side that we couldn't go across the bridge. So uh, the division or our regiment, our division, moved from Dusseldorf down to, oh, I don't forget the name. We went south maybe 100 miles, across the Rhine at, uh, down there, and then we went up what we called the Rural Pocket, and that was from down there back up to Dusseldorf again. And so our division fought from there up to there, and this was primarily all SS personnel, which was tough for us. But anyway, we got up there, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, went into Dusseldorf, and then we went on to Soligen. Soligen is where the Germans were getting all their ball bearings, knives, and things of that nature. And uh, so uh, uh, we uh, rounded up everybody and put them in a, in a uh, stadium, and which we had guards around the top of the stadium and uh, down below. And uh, <laughs> I commandeered a Mercedes convertible that belonged to one of the SS officers, and we drove that around just in that area. And they said, you better get out of there, they'll eliminate you. <laughs> so anyway, and then we, somebody took that over, and then we moved on across Germany to Schelb, which was... Uh, just to just across the border from Czechoslovakia, and we uh, we uh, Patton showed up, and then we crossed and we went into Czechoslovakia, and we were in there about five miles. We had radio messages. You guys get back out of there. The Russians are taking that. So I thought a minute and I said. Uh, because I always had a bright answer. And I said, well, give me more two, day, two more days and we'll take Czechoslovakia. And he says, get out of there. <laughs> that was our answer. <laughs> but anyway, we moved back and the war ended. And uh, uh, they moved our division into a bivouac area in a big field. And uh, we were there maybe two weeks. And uh, so they took our division and packed us up. We went back to Lahar and from Lahar back to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, we were given a 30-day furlough. Let's, uh, once again, I'm going to stop you here and, and, yeah. and back up and, and ask you some questions about your European part of your okay. experience. And then we'll move yeah, on to, okay. to the other. Uh, so being in the recon division, you were always up on the front line or ahead of the front line. Yeah, yes, right. Uh, had to be a very dangerous uh, oh, yes. position to be in. Yeah. Uh, any any times that stick out in your mind that you thought, boy, I'm, I may not make it through this particular incident? Yeah, uh, we, we spotted a barn that had a hole in the roof about so big. So we laid our old 50 right into that. And uh, we never heard from them. And we went on. You see, if anything, we were running into the German recons. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, 
every now and again we'd have a little bit of a little firepower at each other and, and we took off. I was lucky and never got hit once. Hmm. But anyway, uh, that's what would happen. And I'll tell you a side story about that. We went in behind the lines there and here was this beautiful home. Nobody in it. No troops that we could tell around it or anything. So we went in and we took this long table and we took the the uh, uh, silver and the, the crystal and the plates and everything and all lined ourselves up with a with like we were going to have a banquet and uh, uh, oh by the way we did find a wine cellar but anyway <laughs> we uh, uh, we took all of our sea rations and put them in the plates and we had a banquet in this house. <laughs> and underneath the seats in the Jeep was about this deep, in the back row. And so we took wine bottles and we shoved them in there like that. Don't ask me what happened after that. <laughs> but anyway, we, uh, we moved back again and uh, uh, we were on the, let's say, the south side of our division going uh, west. But anyway, uh, we uh, got our orders to go back, so we went back to Fort... To Fort uh, oh, I'm still not done with this. Okay. Yeah, I'm going I'm to pepper you with some questions here in Europe. Uh, how, now, how, when you would go out on these missions, what, big, what size of group would go out on them? With you, I mean, what? How many men would go out on, on these missions? Uh, there was four of us four? In, in this jeep. And uh, as I say, we had to back up a few times, but uh, uh, I think in a lot of cases we surprised them. Didn't know that anybody was even in there, coming up on them. But uh, we'd uh, we'd get to get out of there in a hurry, and. Uh, uh, and we would report back, and we met. I got this map, and, and this is where they were, and so forth. And and uh, then, then the commanders of each one of these regiments would put in the, where they were going to set up their stuff to go ahead. What well, What would go through your mind as you, as uh, before you would go out on a mission? I must have. You must have thought. I would think if I was going out, it's like you know, I'm going out on another mission that. I mean, I come back. I mean, did did you that ever play on your mind at all, or? We only had one wounded uh, out of another INR group. He went out, they didn't find anybody, so they were horsing around and wrestling with herself. And a German come up and let them have it, and one of them got wounded in the leg before the rest of them got the German. So. Uh, that's the only wound we had. Is that right? Yeah. And I, I still never know why or anything. Huh. Yeah. I'll just be darn. Just a... Well, now as you guys are moving across Europe, uh, can you uh, explain or try to describe to to myself and those that will watch this film what you were seeing as far as the damage of the war and the villages and what was the scenes like? Uh, oh, they were. Time we got there, they were all blown to hell. They were just uh, rubble, and the streets seemed to be cleared out. Somebody went in there and cleared those streets out, and uh, I guess so that the people that survived could go back and get their stuff and what have you. So it was really a mess, and uh, uh, yeah, I always thought going through one of those towns that thank God for our bomb fans. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll be darned. And, uh, but anyway. Did you ever have any interaction with the local population, the civilians at no, all? No, no. 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 They, uh, they pretty much stayed by themselves. Yeah. They, yeah. They didn't want to interfere with us in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Fear that I do, we do something to them. Yeah. We didn't have that in mind. Totally. Right. Right. So you guys worked your way all the way across. Germany into, into Czechoslovakia. Did you ever physically meet up with the Russians at all, or did you pull out before? Oh, no, yeah. No, we okay. Yeah. 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 Although I will say, at one time we went down 
through this town, down a hill, and through a gate, a big arch gate, going into the town, and we turned uh, left, and we was going along, and the Germans started firing at us out of the hospital windows. So that tells you how far in we were. Yeah, right, yeah. And I said, what the hell? So I was sitting on the hood of the Jeep, and the Jeep driver slammed on the brakes, and so I go <laughs> flying. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny, too, because I ended up in the ditch. And uh, uh, anyway, we didn't have any hits there, but <clears throat> so we went on out of town, and we're going up this hill, and we saw this whole group of, we didn't know what they were, but they were Russians or they were whoever. And uh, so pretty soon they saw us, and out of the ditches come these white t-shirts like this. So we fired our 50 over them, and they all got back down in. And then I could tell that there were German uh, guards, and they were taking the Russians, some prisoners, away from them. So uh, uh, we let our old fifties go again, and then the then the Russians come out, captured the guards, shot them, and uh, then here come this Russian uh, officer down to see us with his boots all polished and he was he was A1 dressed. Of course his troops were not that way. Yeah. And uh, uh, he could speak just a little English and of course we told him, we said he wanted to know where to take his troops. And I said, Well you walk back down that way, make sure you got your your shirts up there and about ten miles back you ought to be able to get food and what have you. So, and what did they do? With all this gunfire going around, the Russians come and put us up on their shoulders and they were happy and all that. And I didn't get me, I kept going like this. I didn't want to be up there. And uh, anyway, uh, that was one of the last experiences of, of our uh, Actual combat? Eastern, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, where were you uh, when you heard uh, word about the German surrender? Uh, we were we were still in Czechoslovakia. This was uh, May 8th, I believe, or 9th. I believe it was the 9th. And uh, so we just move back. And that must have been a relief though to, oh. to know that you'd made it through the war or at least that part of the war. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I said, well, okay, Joe, you made it. <laughs> uh, Didn't get a scratch. I'll be done. No. Uh, and we ducked all kinds of gunfire. But... Uh, well, let me uh, ask too, you, you had mentioned that you and Bonnie had been married in 43, so uh, did you marry when you were on leave or before you entered the service? Or? No. We went to, uh, 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 we were going to go to uh, uh, rifle shooting and I uh, uh, went in and told the company commander, I said, I'd like a three-day pass because this was in Macomb, Illinois and we were in Des Moines. Uh -huh. A three-day pass to go home and we were, my bride and I were going to get married and all that kind of stuff and he says, I'll tell you what you do. You go out and shoot expert and I'll give you a second three-day pass. <laughs> so I blew that bullseye out of there. <laughs> so uh, we uh, we got home. We, we were married and all that kind of stuff. Took the train from Macomb, Illinois, to which was out of Chicago, to the Quad Cities, and then I had to change to the Rock Island Rocket which I went on into Des Moines, and... Uh, but that, but those two three-day or six-day passes, that gave you enough time to get home, get married, and, uh, and, and with no problems? Yeah. Imagine you didn't have time much for much of a honeymoon then, or uh, did you? One night we one. went to uh, Omaha. 
Omaha. I can only remember the hotel we stayed in. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, great deals. Now, would that be the last time you'd see Bonnie before, until uh, you shipped out, or did you have any more opportunities to see her before you yes, shipped I over? Yes, I did. And uh, <clears throat> then we went to Europe, and uh, then uh, we had one daughter, and uh, I didn't see her till I was uh, uh, six months. So you had a, you had a daughter while you were uh, the daughter was born while you were overseas. Yes, yeah. Oh boy. Oh. How how was that as far as being a, overseas? I guess to back up a question I yeah. usually ask in the beginning. How was that transition for you going from civilian life into military life? Was that much of a transition for you at all? Oh. I don't know. I just expected it, yeah, and I yeah. just lived with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I guess kind of a related question: How was that? Now you're overseas in battle. I mean, there's probably got to be some homesickness playing into it, uh, as well as probably missing your wife. But now you've got a newborn daughter. What was that like being away from from that? Oh, uh, well, it was. Uh, I figured I was just part of it. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And, and, oh, and I missed it like the devil, of course. But you know, you, what could I do about it? Yeah, that was, right. That was the way it was, and right. I wasn't alone this way either. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, that was something else. Now, did, uh, on the on the reverse side, uh, back on the home front, did did Bonnie ever talk about what she was going through? Because she she couldn't you couldn't tell her exactly where you were at. Uh, she. We correspond by emails. Yeah, and how or V mail. V mail. Yeah. And how was that? Was that pretty reliable? Were you particularly oh, with you guys on the move all the time? Oh yeah. Sometimes it'd be uh, three or four weeks coming through. Maybe it'd be longer than that. Sometimes a week. Depends on where we were and what we were doing. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd write a letter and send it to her, but that may take quite a while. Yeah, because they all had to be censored. Yeah, right, right, right. And uh, <laughs> well, anyway, that was that story. Yeah, yeah. How was it uh, through your time through Europe, uh, as far as just actual living conditions, as far as your the food? Uh, uh, were you getting enough sleep? Uh, your your accommodations. How, talk about just daily life. How okay, uh, sea rations. We would take and wire them to the engine of the jeep, and that way we get them hot, and then we have hot food. And uh, oh, I don't know. I don't remember too much about sleeping or or what we did. We'd come across a stream or something. We'd all take our swim and bass and so on, but. Uh, I don't know. Uh, didn't really think a whole lot about it, except it was a hardship, but so what, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. You would find that everybody had the same idea and the same note about it, no griping. Hmm. Oh, we might gripe because we well, now and then we'd get a warm beer. <laughs> 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 but. Uh, we, uh, no, the hardships for the INR platoon was not nearly as bad as the actual ground troops going really? ahead with uh, fighting the, what we'd find. And, uh, so, uh, uh. I've kept some of the maps and situation maps and stuff that I have. Oh, oh, fascinating. Yeah. 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 So the war ends and you guys are there for just a short period of time as part of the occupation forces uh, and then you get called back to the States. When you got called back to the States, did you realize at that point you were heading to Japan or what, what were no, you told? No, at no, no. We were dis not discharged. We were given a 30-day furlough. So we went home and we were home about 20 days. They called us all back, put us in a troop train, 
and took us to Seattle. Of course, that's the embark embarking area for going. And on our way there on the troop train, they dropped one bomb, one atomic bomb. And before we got there, they dropped a second one. And then we, they still put us on the ship. And we were two days out, and they announced the point system, which we could have all stayed home. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 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 we figured out it was too far to swim, so we had to live with it. And we ended up in the Philippines at uh, Cebu, a small island in, in the southern part of the Philippines. And we got off the ship there. And when no one got off, and they said, you guys got to get back on. And so we got back on, and the war wasn't quite over then. But after we were out of that and headed towards Japan, the, uh, uh, the occupation was signed a week before we got into Yokohama. So we spent four months in Japan as occupational troops. Even though, it, even at, the, at that point you guys all had enough points to come home, they still kept you there, huh? Oh yeah, because there was probably more points in the Pacific for troops to go home than what we had because of the tougher fights and everything else they had. So uh, anyway, we spent uh, four months in Japan and uh, uh, our platoon uh, was sent down to the Nippon Airway Photo Lab where they made all the maps for the Japanese uh, commercial flights as well as the military uh, flights for their Air Corps. And uh, we, had, uh, we had probably, uh, oh, let's see, we ended up with three Jeeps and uh, so we wrote our own trip tickets and uh, uh, we went, uh, one load of us went as far up Mount Fujiyama as any automobile has ever been huh. in our Jeep. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we entertained ourselves that way. But anyway, uh, the Nippon Airway Photo Lab was quite an interesting facility. They had German Carl Zeiss equipment, which was the top of the line then. And we were there about three weeks and uh, headquarters come in and boxed all the state-of-the-art equipment sent to the states. Huh. So we still stayed there. And uh, oh, I don't know, we would we'd entertain ourselves by Occupation was really very new. There was no uprisings or anything like that to worry about. So how, yeah, you didn't have to and worry for that. your your safety or anything because you know uh, during the war, I mean, the, the Japanese fought very vicious and oh, yes. and, and but uh, when the war was over, that was it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have much interaction with the, the locals at all, or? Yeah, we would go, and sometimes we'd go and take a train, and uh, they didn't want us to ride in the coaches because we would still be a head higher than they were, or better. But so we'd ride up with the motorman. And there was two motormen in there. And they'd say, Haku! Haku! We finally found out that they were saying all clear. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, oh, I saw MacArthur. Oh, really, yeah? From a distance. and. Japanese moat, and, and uh, I, uh, uh, we toured around a little bit. Now, did you find similar to, to Europe a lot of damage there in Japan as well? Uh, Not really. No? no? Okay. Only where the atomic bombs had landed. Oh, oh so you got that? Did you get down to Hiroshima? I went down knock? there to just look at it and come back. Oh, can you describe to us what you saw there? Oh, that was nothing. I mean, it was flat. It was flat rubble, except for one small building in the center. It was about, oh, I don't know, 
maybe three stories high and maybe uh, 20 by 20 square and it was damaged but it was still standing there but all this other stuff was just flat. Wow. Can't, wow. can't imagine. And uh, so I would say that we were very lucky when we went into Japan as occupational troops. Right, right. Our division went in and cleaned up the Tachikawa airfield, filled in bomb craters and, and uh, uh, scraped up the wrecked airplanes and got them off and, and made it so it was landable for our Air Force to come in. So, uh, and while I was there, uh, my next door neighbor that I grew up with, we went to high school and everything together. The mothers kept contact with each other and told told him where I was and vice versa. So he found me I'll be darned. in Japan. Huh. And that was quite an experience there. He was a, well, I don't know what they called him, but it was like a DC-3, an old time military. Well, it wasn't then, but uh, uh, we got together for a couple of nights, and that was kind of a strange, and yeah. happy occurrence. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then we got to go home. Okay. So we were in this old troop ship that was a, a victory ship, I'm sure. And uh, we got north of the Hawaiian Islands. We run into a real bad storm. No, oh, jeez. Yeah. Where the prop would come out of the water and beat it, and everything like that. And then when the storm was over with, they stopped. And they said we got to do a little repair work. So they welded. They lowered some welders down over the side to weld up the side. <laughs> so this is a victory ship, you know. Yeah. Right. So that was our experience going home. Uh, then I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, no, Fort Leonard, or Kansas, and was discharged from there. Now, any idea why the 97th was chosen to go f over to Japan of all the divisions? Why? Because we'd been trained for the invasion. Oh, that's right. Go, full circle. We're going full circle here. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they said, well, since these guys have had trouble, they would, they would, they'd be able to have trouble over there while we could handle that, but we never had an ounce of trouble that I ever heard about. And, uh, yeah. So you're discharged at, at Fort Leonard, and I take it you took, took off for home for Des Moines? And, yes. Yeah. And so I got home, and Bonnie said, we got a house full of company, dad and mom. And I said, well, okay. That don't bother me any. So I said, uh, well, what's going on? Well, we're going down to the Tromar Ballroom, downtown Des Moines. I said, yeah. And Von Monroe's going to be there. So the first night home, we saw Von Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> uh. and, but uh, then, then, uh, the company got a hold of me right away and said, you got to come back to work for us. So I was immediately employed and... Did you have any time to kind of just relax between getting home and going to work or was... No. Yeah. No, went right to work. And um, uh, I was... Uh, went back to work. There was a couple of old guys there that was engineers and uh, they went by the way and uh, here I was again in, in charge of the engineering department. I wasn't dry bar in years. But anyway, <laughs> that was my job and I kept with them. I took some extension courses from Iowa State College and, and as life went on, I, uh, uh, oh, probably 15 years before I retired, I became the vice president of engineering. 
for the same you worked the whole, same company your whole career is that right yeah. how many years all together did you work there uh, let me see I think it was 45 years is that right yeah and uh, I developed uh, garden tractors lawn tractors Walk behind mowers, snow throwers, tillers, edgers, all for Sears under the Craftsman label. Okay. Uh huh. So uh, that was my my job. Oh, uh, be darn! Wow. Yeah, I had as high as as uh, twenty people under me, craftsmen, engineers, and so forth, and uh, I was just a lucky individual. I couldn't do it today like that. Yeah, yeah, right. I couldn't do it uh, even then, real easily. But I, I fit the position, and I knew how to design tools and and everything. Like I designed some of the tools for making bomb fins that uh, cut some of the time that that uh, we on our old tools to make it and uh, everything of that nature. And then right after the war, we got into making silo hardware. Uh, threading the rods went around, the lugs, the uh, ladders, the, uh, the uh, chutes, and uh, the wood frame openings that went in to put the doors in, the doors that swell up and seal, and uh, uh, that was just one thing. We went back into making uh, wash machine parts for Maytag and mm. One Minute and Automatic Washer and Dexter Washer and all those companies. And so our company decided that we needed product of our own. So I designed a motor scooter and we sold 25,000 of them to Western Auto Stores. And uh, then uh, we got into the toy business, riding toys for kids. One was a little pedal tractor, and another was what we call the Irish Mail. You know what an Irish Mail is? No. Yep. Well, had two big wheels here and a nice body, and you'd guide with your, your feet, and you'd pull the stick back and forth to make it go. And uh, uh, we made those. Uh, uh, for, for Western Auto, and then, then we got into making toys, and as I say, the little wraparound things, and, and uh, uh, then we got into go karts, and we made oh, probably three thousand go karts for uh, Sears, uh, the Sears, uh, and uh, Paducah, Kentucky, would get them by the carload. I don't know what they did with them down there, but. These were racing carts, yeah. and uh, so let me see what else did we do? Uh, uh, oh, we made go karts for Goodyear, and they put their little slicks on it, and uh, uh, let me just grab this a minute. So by the time you retire, you said you'd work yourself up to vice president? Yes. I'll be darned. Uh. Hotel Fontenelle is where we had our one night, <laughs> one night stay. <laughs> now how was it, uh, one question I uh, ask on the back side of this, how was, how was the transition for you after all you'd been through, through Europe, Japan and stuff, how was that transition for you going from military life back to civilian life? No, 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 yeah. And, and how about your daughter? How long did it take for her to warm up to you, to this strange man that she that had only seen maybe once or twice? Uh... Well, she was about uh, 18 months old. There's no problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, huh? Yeah. There's no problem. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a situation map. I don't know okay, we'll, yeah, we'll put that on, the, on here okay. in a few minutes after we're done with the interview. Yeah. Uh, let me just... There we are in Japan. Yeah. discharge papers, what have you. 
and uh, Corps of Engineers, all that kind of stuff. So now, what brought you out here to uh, Colorado from Iowa? Well, and how long you been out in Fort Collins area? Well, when I was this tall, I had a great aunt that lived in uh, 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 Morrison, and uh, she lived up on a hill, and here was the entrance, to, the main entrance to the Red Rocks Park then, and uh, she, uh, we went out to see her. And uh, the only thing I remember about that trip, they had a great big fireplace with big rocks on it. Mm. Everything else. Had cousins visit us not too long ago, and we have going through the family album. There this house was, and I said, let's go see if we can find it. So we went down there, and here was a labor over the door, a circle, home, whatever. And uh, so... Uh, Knocked on the door, no one was home. So I looked in the window, and this fireplace was probably this big. <laughs> <laughs> so that shows you what, yeah. what your memory yeah, is. Yeah, right, yeah. But uh, that's one occasion, and uh, we sent uh, our daughter, one daughter, to see you. And she never came home. They live down in Morrison now. And uh, uh, we, uh, oh, when I was designing snow throwers and snowmobiles, we would take them up to uh, Snowy Range Mountain okay. Park up uh -huh. there because they had the high plateaus and uh, we could run snowmobiles up there and what have you. So snowmobiles is one thing we developed and uh, we, uh, well we, uh, uh, we stayed out there, had enough machines that uh, uh, Bonnie would always go with us, she had a machine, and uh, uh, one time we had to entertain the Sears buyers, and this was on Mount, uh, the big mountain down close to Denver, Evans, and uh, uh, we took them up there, and Bonnie had, had fixed sandwiches in the back, in the back end of the snowmobile. And so we got up there and we had lunch and so forth and, and uh, we had enough machines that it was five Sears buyers oh. and uh, uh, we sold them for a while, I think about a year. And uh, uh, then our corporation, which was a Roper Corporation, decided there was too much liability in them for the rest of the products we were building that you could wipe out everything. So we got out of that. But we still made snow throwers and uh, edgers and tillers and all under the craftsman label. Yeah, yeah. So you'd done enough of those products that, <coughs> and came out here enough times that you're familiar with the area and just like well, the area? And well, we had a 32-foot 32 32 travel trailer down in Savannah, Georgia, where our uh, engineering office was, and so forth, designing a snowmobile in Savannah, Georgia. But anyway, we take our travel trailer down. So when I retired, we had that. So we sold our home down there. So we went up to Chicago. One of the granddaughters going to retire, not retire, to graduate from from high school. And then we drove it on out here and we parked it down at Jellystone in Loveland. I don't know whether you're familiar with that or not. Yeah. And uh, so we parked it there for about three months while we traveled all up and down the front range to see where we wanted to live. And so we found a house or a nice big condo right here in Fort Collins on Cheyenne Circle. So anyway, we uh, we lived there for 18 years, and then we said we ought to start the downsizing, so we went to the Argyle Apartments out here on South uh, Timberline. Then the kids got a hold of us again, said you got to downsize again, so that's why we moved here. Gotcha. Yeah. And these things, both of us can walk without those. Yeah. We don't need them. Yeah. But because I fell once. 
the kids went up and bought that for me. Yeah. And uh, so this is yeah. where we are today, I guess. Now, now through the years, have you ever kept in touch with uh, guys you, you serve with, or ever gone to any of the reunions and such? I have one individual called uh, Earl Stanky. We we'll always call him Stinky. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and he does all the writing and everything, and he's a wood carver. And he carved, uh, uh, who was it, Eisenhower or somebody, in wood, wood plaque as heck. Uh, and uh, so he sent it to him. They corresponded for a while, and and uh, so he, but he's he lives in Glen Allen, Illinois, but we correspond. So. Have you ever has there ever been any like ninety seventh uh, reunions or anything like that get-togethers that? Uh... I guess there was one. Oh, okay. And I didn't go to it. Yeah. Because I'd had enough of it. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but that wasn't the real reason. Yeah. Just now, through the years, uh, either with business or, or pleasure, have you ever been able to travel back to any places you were stationed and either here in the States or Japan yes. or Europe? Or? Yes. They had an outdoor power show in Paris, and we had some of our equipment over there showing it. So. I always took Bonnie with me in any places, so we went to Paris, and we, after the show, we had this rented car, so we took off for a couple of weeks. And so we went clear down into Italy and all around and everything else, and we got back and we a little early, and I said, hey, let's follow my steps. Oh, wow. So we went back up to La Harve, and we started off from there, and clear up to Dusseldorf, and uh, uh, there they had a bridge, but I said, no, we're not going across that bridge, we're going down along the Rhine. We did that, come up, come back up around Soligen, and uh, 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 we was driving down the street in Soligen, and I said, I've been here. And I said, turn here. So I turned, there's supposed to be a stadium down here, but there was a park. So I got off and there was a lady sitting on a the bench there, and we conversed there the best we could, found out that they tore the stadium down and built a park out of it. And uh, so we went back uptown and, and uh, there was a little knife store. Because Soliwin was big for making knives and scissors and, and razors and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, we went into this little store and this lady was as old as I was. And they started conversing with her. She said, yes, her, her husband was a salesman for uh, selling ball bearings over here. And so he was tied up with that during the war. And so on. So I told her we went through here. And uh, Sullivan was never hurt with uh, bombs. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I saw all these pocket knives in here. And, and, uh, oh, I just looked at him, I didn't think about it. So I was walking out, and she called me back. She says, what kind of a pocket knife would you like? Can you imagine? Hmm, wow. And so she gave me this pocket knife and a sheath to put it in. I've lost it someplace yeah. over the years. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, that was one... One thing that we found on the trips, we went all the way to the German border going into Czechoslovakia and there they had Checkpoint Charlie and I didn't have papers with me because right. I hadn't even planned on going it, into sure, Czechoslovakia. Right. So we stayed there in a little town called Playstein. And uh, Playstein, when we went back this time, was just like it was before when we were there. And the ducks and the cattle was in the street. And, uh, and the barns were attached to the houses, and yeah. I remember all of that stuff. Huh. And it hadn't changed a bit, except here come a fellow from the farm line, and a big tractor, and he had a bench built over the big wheel so that the kids could ride on it. And that was his car and transportation and everything. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Gene, so, we'll start. Oh, go so ahead. It, uh, my wife there, who we went back, that uh, silver, uh, red thing there, and there's a dish it's sitting in, 
we lived in this town here, we saw a window that showed all this cut glass in it. And with a little sign, so we went around to the back, and here was this fellow back there, and he had a vice of a vote. A bowl, okay, and it had marked with black marks on it. And he was sitting there in the grinder and grinding that stuff out, and that's how he was making his cut glass. So we were very fortunate, and we bought some glass there, which was very inexpensive comparatively, and uh, so we brought that back. But, uh, well, I did. I want to back up just a touch. I did have a German Luger and brought it home with me. Had a big, huge swastika flag. Brought that back. And, uh, oh no, miscellaneous other things. Uh -huh. But uh, our son in law, he retired uh, from Vietnam, retired Lieutenant Colonel. The Marines, and so I've passed that stuff on to him. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, oh, I don't know. I've had, I would say, a very interesting life. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I suppose we went to Europe four times. Went to Scotland once. But I'm Scottish, and. Uh, we went all through that area. I didn't find any of my relation there. Mom had kept a handwritten family tree that went back to 1790. Hmm. And uh, that was handed down to her for a ways and then she carried it on. We went to a library there and this library was covered with uh, fish, uh, microfish. And, uh, Oh, and he went along there and he pulled this one out. I had this with me and he looked it over and he found people on both sides of it. I said, well, well, he says, don't worry. He says they were burning a lot of churches then. And the churches was who kept the, uh, the uh, applications for birth, birth mm -hmm. certificates. And, uh, and he says, you know, they might have got married on the boat going to the States. And uh, so he had to have this handwritten one, so he said, if I get other people in here, at least I'll know I can match them up and so on. But uh, I never did hear back from him, so hmm. I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Gene, we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview. Okay. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any stories that have popped up in your mind since we've been sitting here that you want to talk about, just to make sure we hopefully round out your story as best we okay. can. Okay. Uh, oh, on our troop train from uh, South Carolina to Seattle, we had cast, not cast, but angle iron bunk beds made in these cars, three deep. And that's what the train was made up of. And so we got to Cheyenne up here, and the train stopped, and we all got off because they had car tables set up with all the goodies and stuff on them. And uh, then uh, we got back on and went on. But I thought that was quite interesting because that was, well, think about going on a troop train. Yeah, how long of a journey would that have been to roughly? Oh, it had to be three or four thousand miles, I imagine. Now, how long would it have taken you by train? Do you remember roughly? Oh, I suppose we were, I don't know, five days, a week, maybe. And, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you got called back, so you had to go from Des Moines back to South Carolina, yeah. to Carolina, go South Carolina to Seattle, yeah, then. Huh? Right. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I went across the United States. I don't know how many high times because they went. To, did I tell you I went to Camp Ritchie, Maryland? I guess I did. No, no, no. No, Camp Ritchie, Maryland, and that's where they had photo interpretation, and I got to read uh, 
uh, uh, aerial flights okay. through glasses to get the stereo the image of it. And uh, I remember one of them before the invasion of Europe, and uh, we had one of the coast there. And you could pick out the. the Are you two guys still yeah. talking? Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. And oh, and I'm downstairs. You know, and I'll I'll nice. be around. Come on in. Come on in. No. No. Fine. <laughs> but uh, uh, the uh, it was uh, it was a pretty good trip. We got to Seattle, got off the train, got on the ship. Oh, geez. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned before, I think I talked to you. We was two two days out and announced yeah. the paint, point system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Too well, far to swim. Yeah. Well, that must have been pretty interesting for you. I mean, uh, here growing up, pretty much like anybody during that time period, yeah. I don't imagine you traveled too far away from Des Moines, and now here, uh, over the next couple of years, you crisscross the country or in Europe and in, in Japan. I mean, my dad loved to travel. Did he? Oh, did he? Oh, okay. And I remember one trip we went from Des Moines to Winnipeg, Canada. Oh. Uh, just on the two lane highway then. And out of Canada, some of it was paved, some of it was gravel, and so forth. We went to Moose Jaw in Canada, which is north of Montana. And, uh, to visit my uncle. My uncle's house had two sides of it. All the paint was gone from the storms that they had, and there was sort of like a snowdrift of dirt around it, like that. And uh, uh, they were surviving. That's about all. They had this big Clydesdale that uh, they did uh, most of their farming with, and. Uh, they had a Model T, and uh, well, that was just about their possessions then. Wow. And so anyway, we visited them there, so we went to go home, and we went down south into Montana, and that was just on a one leg road, gravel road, and we got down to where we crossed the border, sign, entering the USA. Huh, that was yeah, it. That was it. Nobody there or anything. We went on down, and they were building the. Um, I don't want to say Fort Peck Dam. I believe that was it in Montana, and uh, then we went on down to the Rushmore Memorials, and there was three of them finished, and they were still working on one. Wow. I was, you know, a little kid, and uh, then we. Uh, went on to Des Moines. Yeah. Uh, Dad, uh, did I tell you about Dad having the grocery store? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, one last question I always like to ask right. towards the end. Um, how do you think those war years played a part in your life, changed your life, affected your life, or did it? Or was it just simply just a chapter of your life you went through? How would you answer that, do you think? I would say that uh, early in my life, the mechanical drawing teacher in my high school, gave me a recommendation to the company I went to work for. So when I graduated from high school, the next day I started to work for them. And I've been blessed with events all my life that uh, I could never complain about. Yeah. And, th and th that the event of your war years was just, to you, just another event in your life? Or did, yeah. is there anything? stuck out that changed you at all with that, uh, with particularly what you saw no. and experienced? It was just, yeah. yeah. I, uh, uh, I will tell you one experience we had when we got out of here. I went down to the savings loan company to see if I could get some money to build a house with. And uh, sure, how much you need? And I said, oh, I don't know, 13000 maybe. And uh, he said, okay, shook hands. And he says, I'll get the paperwork one of these days. Huh. How can you imagine? Well, I built this house and got ready to settle up on it. 
and found out it had enough drywall in it for two homes and two picture windows. So the contractor I had was bad. So I went down and told him this. Ah, don't worry, we'll take your house. We'll get rid of it for you. You know it costs you. And I said, no, I'm going to sell it. Because it was really quite a house. So I sold it and made enough money for a down payment on another house. And uh, so that got us started. I'll be done. Uh, uh. Yeah. Had a LaSalle. I uh, bought one car right after the war, and a guy had painted the dipstick to make it look like oil, and I brought it, brought it home. Didn't smoke. Well, it didn't smoke because there's no oil to smoke. And oh, so geez. I started checking the thing on it. Sold it two weeks later and made a hundred. And uh, so then my next car was this uh, 41 LaSalle. And I still have some of the radiator parts out here. That, Is that right? That, that, huh. The grill, I should say. And uh, uh, that was a beautiful car. And so I've been kind of a car nut ever since. Have you? Yeah. And I bought a Tornado when they first came out. And uh, I had a wreck in it where a fellow come across the interstate and hit me head on. Ooh. But I walked away because of this big engine. The engine was a 425 cubic inch and was 325 horsepower. I won because I had all that cast iron up front. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I had four more Tornados. I figured they, that was a beautiful car. Yeah. Uh. They don't, of course, Oldsmobile's out of business and they don't make holes anymore. Yeah, so. yeah. But, uh, well, but to cap off this interview, is there any sort of statement or uh, comment you would like to make to friends and family that will watch this to, to cap it off or not? Well, I don't know whether I even mentioned the honor flight, but that was one of the uh, highlights of my retirement. And, and uh, they were all behind it and got, to, got a lot of the information for me and so on and, and uh, took us down to the airport and from then on you know the story. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, that's where I got that quilt. Uh -huh. and, uh, let me think, what else? There ought to be other, sign, other things. Well, I'm sure if I opened up these books here, I could tell you a lot yeah. more. Okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll do that then. Okay. So, well, Gene, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, thank you. I, uh, my pleasure. This is our wedding picture. It was August 23rd, 1943. And uh, that's where it all starts. There's uh, a picture of me at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, uh, Missouri. Uh, we were uh, there for training. Oh. oh. Uh, yeah, this is uh, 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 the 97th Infantry Division's uh, shoulder patch and uh, by dog tags. And uh, there was a book underneath this right here that tells about the, uh, uh, the uh, action book that we had during our divisional training. And Here's a picture of us uh, in Germany and uh, uh, I don't know which one is me on which side, but one of them is me because uh, uh, of our age, I guess, I kind of slipped by on it. <laughs> hmm. As part of my job in Germany was to make situation maps uh, showing the position of 
the troops and the different uh, uh, regiments and where they were and, and what the target was. And this is one of the maps here? Yes. This is a newspaper uh, ad showing where most of the troops were in Europe. Uh, nothing uh, special about this except that this is what the people had to look at. So that would give Bonnie an idea where you were at then? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a picture of Hitler that uh, obtained uh, oh, through lost albums and things of that nature that belonged to the Germans. But uh, uh, we uh, I put that in a scrapbook that I had. Now, as you were telling me as we were going through the scrapbook, this whole scrapbook you carried in your pack throughout the war. Is that correct? See this? See how it's all packed down like uh -huh. that? This was the size of the pack. Well, I'll be darned. Okay, we landed here in Le Havre, and we took off through here, went through Belgium, up this way, and uh, we come down out of there this way. Through Germany. To Germany, to... Uh, I can't read that. Pilsen? No, that's, that, that's later. Where were we? Oh, Frankfurt. I've got to find Dusseldorf. There we are, Dusseldorf. That's where we went in, right there to battle there. And we come down here along the Rhine. We crossed over, went up through what we called the Ruhr Pocket to Soligan, and then we come on down this way and then we were out of combat by here. And then we traveled from here to catch up to, to um, Walden right here. And then we went over, there's the borderline here, mm -hmm. and we went into Czechoslovakia. I guess they called it Bohemian then. But anyway, See the Pilsen there? Uh -huh. We were five miles outside of Pilsen when they told us to stop and get back out of there. So we backed out right to here. And uh, uh, Patton's first uh, army, or first, uh, uh, he, he was about here, and he backed up and went another way back. Okay. But we went up this way, and we went over here, and we went into to um, oh glasses don't work as good as they used to right to right in here we stopped Wartburg no Some of these names changed from German to American. I can't, can't quite figure them out. But anyway, we come right back to this town here. And then, uh, then we had a um, one-day trip into Pil into Paris. There's Paris. Oh yeah, we went this way into Paris. Had one day trip, and then we went back to here, and we went back here, and we departed from La Havre where we entered in. I'll be darned. Yeah. How, how many days, roughly, were, were you? D did this whole path take? Do you think? Uh, oh, probably. Maybe six weeks. Maybe longer. Okay. Well, it's got to be longer. Yeah. Two months, maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. This. Uh, this is my Eisenhower jacket that I wore coming home from the service. I was a buck sergeant then, and uh, we, uh, uh, well, when I try it on today, it comes to here and here, and I need four inches to button it up with, so <laughs> that's where life goes. And uh, these were just some of the things that uh, I was awarded. Well, you've got this, your, uh, let's just let's, uh, describe to people that'll see this. This is your infantry uh, badge. Uh, yes, right. And uh, uh, this was just a ribbon of the area we were in. Uh -huh. And uh, this was my discharge eagle. Okay. And uh, 
course, these were different. That's infantry, and that's the U.S. And this was when I was a cadet that I had. It doesn't go with this jacket, but I yeah. put it on there in order to keep it. Now, how long were you in the cadet school before they uh, canceled about, that, right? About uh, five and a half months. Oh, so you were pretty far into the program then. Oh, yes. We were ready to go to Santa Ana to learn how to fly. And they said, oh, we're awfully sorry, but we don't need any more pilots or navigators, so we have a place for you in the infantry. So that was what happened to the cadet training. Wow. Now I notice there's two uh, bar or two stars. Was that uh, for the two battles you guys were in? Yeah, probably so. I okay. don't remember now. Okay. But anyway, those are. This was uh, uh, Pacific and no, this was Pacific and this was German or uh, Europe. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then here is the uh, 97th yeah. insignia. Yeah. Yes. And how about uh, the insignia on your uh, left shoulder then? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very don't good. Remember. All right. So anyway, a lot of people don't have that yet. Absolutely. That's my Eisenhower jacket.